Thank you for joining us today on our new session as part of the GESI webinar series. As you know, or for those joining us for the first time, the GESI webinar series serves as a platform for the GESI network members to share experience and expertise in evidence synthesis and to learn about potential collaborations. My name is Tamara Lutri. I'm the coordinator for the GESI Secretariat, and I'll be moderating the session today. Before we begin, if you're using GoToWebinar for the first time, um, you, yeah, as you might have noticed, you are automatically muted as soon as you've signed up. Um, so if you would like to submit any comment or question, please use the tab on the right. If you'd like to make the comment and address our presenter directly, you can use the raise your hand button and then we can unmute you so that you can discuss directly with our presenter. Today's session is part of our webinar series on stakeholder engagement in environmental evidence synthesis. Our session today is on five, a five-step approach for stakeholder engagement in prioritization and planning of environmental evidence synthesis. And our presenter is Biliana Makura. Biliana is a colleague of ours, a friend of ours, and we're very happy to have her with us today. She is a research fellow at Stockholm Environmental Institute, an environmental social scientist with the main research focus on the provision of robust evidence for decision-making in environmental policy and practice. Biliana is conducting systematic evidence synthesis in the field of environmental management and working on the improvement of systematic review methods in the same field. She is a co-creator of ROSES, which stands for Reporting Standards, uh, for uh, systematic reviews in environmental uh, field and editorial manager of the Collaboration for Environmental Evidence journal, Environmental Evidence. Thank you, Biliana, for joining us today. Thank you, Tom. Um, so in a few seconds, we'll be able to see your slides. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, looks great. Perfect. So should I start with a with a talk? Yes, yes. Uh, would you like us to launch the poll first? Um, no, I will I will let you know. Okay, great. Okay. So sorry about this. So hello everyone. Uh, everyone. Uh, as uh, thanks uh, Tamara for the introduction. As Tamara already mentioned, I will um, today uh, hopefully give you an interesting um, overview of uh, an approach that we were using in a project I was involved a couple of years ago in, and this is approach for stakeholder engagement in uh, priority. Uh, pri and planning of environmental uh, evidence uh, synthesis. Okay, so um, this is just an, an, an overview of how this um, uh, webinar will, uh, will look like. First, I will give you a little bit of uh, introduction to stakeholder engagement. Then uh, I will try to introduce um, stakeholder engagement approach and give you some examples. Uh, then I will share the challenges, the lessons we learned um, while applying this approach and also provide some recommendations. And finally, hopefully we will have some time uh, at the very end to um, discuss and clarify uh, things that you would like to know more about um, the approach I'm going to uh, present. Okay, so first, um, to get us into the right kind of thinking, I would like you to answer a poll question and I would like you to uh, tell me whether you have ever attempted to co-create or co-design your research with so-called non-experts. I'm interested to know how many people have been engaged in uh, co-creation or co-design processes. Okay, so it seems that there are this. It seems that this webinar is going to be very useful. So because uh, none of you seem to be um, 
engaging in any of the of the um, in co-creation um, approaches so that is great okay so let's move on um, as you know um, systematic sorry, systematic reviews and uh, systematic maps are golden standard synthesis methods uh, that try to uh, kind of increase uh, transparency and comprehensiveness and try to minimize the biases during the uh, every stage of the review process. These uh, review processes, uh, the, the review stages are identification and formulation of the review question, then um, publishing the review protocol, searching for studies, inclusion of relevant studies, uh, assessing the validity of the studies if you're conducting systematic review, if you're uh, conducting a systematic map that, um, that uh, step is not um, uh, done, then extraction and synthesis of the findings, and then finally writing a, a review report. However, uh, in order to create a valuable um, reviews and valuable findings from those reviews for policy and practice, you need to ask a very relevant review questions. This is probably obvious. But also the findings of the review process. Uh, findings of the review need to be re uh, recognized as the uh, legitimate evidence. Uh, in order to do that, uh, I would argue that engagement with organizations and individuals who use um, your uh, reviews or affected by the reviews finding has to be uh, done. And it's very, very crucial, the engagement process. Um, however, the stakeholder engagement process can be done throughout the, the whole review process from question uh, formulation to report writing. But today's session and today's focus is actually only on the stakeholder, uh, stakeholder engagement that early stages of the, of the review planning process at the question formulation and until um, uh, drafting of the um, systematic review uh, protocol. Okay, so first of all, I would like uh, us to be on the same page and would like to share some definitions of the key concepts I'm going to use uh, throughout this uh, presentations. Uh, presentation. So by stakeholder, uh, in this presentation, I mean um, those who are those who uh, use or may be affected uh, by our review findings, and these stakeholders can be researchers, the subject experts, can be practitioners, or people who are funding the reviews. Uh, they can be representatives of academia, governmental and non-governmental organizations, etc. So this is a very broad, as you can see, definition of a uh, stakeholder. When it comes to the stakeholder engagement, I would like to define it as a bi-directional relationship between the stakeholder and the researcher that results in informed decision making about uh, certain stages of the review process and the review findings. Okay, so I will present you approach for early stakeholder engagement, but, but I will present that approach in a case example. As I already mentioned, um, this um, is a project that I've been involved in, and this project uh, is called Evidence-Based Environmental Management, or EVM, and it's funded by um, um, Swedish uh, Research Strategic Environmental Funding. It was funded from 2012 to 2018. Um, so the project has finished, but more information can be found in, in the link provided. Um, it was, um, EVM was conducting reviews uh, relevant, but not restricted to the Swedish context. And these reviews were about environmental management. And uh, the aim of the Biliana, we uh, can't hear final. Yes? Yeah, we can hear now again. So can you please repeat the slide? Uh, this slide. Excuse me. Yes. 
yes so i am uh, going to uh, i'm going to show the um, I'm going to show the approach on a case example of AVM, which is a project was running from 2012 to 2018 and was financed by the Strategic Environmental uh, Council or Foundation, it's called MISTRA. Uh, more information is provided on the on the slide here. So uh, it, uh, AVM was conducting reviews relevant, but not restricted to the Swedish context. And aim was to improve the basis for decisions in Swedish environmental policy and management. Um, and it was composed of uh, executive committee, methodology expert, and was working with an international team of scientific experts. This uh, setup was giving financial and political independence of this body. And these reviews that were produced were uh, reviews um, uh, that can be considered as a public goods because they were produced with a public um, or general audience in mind. Um, they were produced in an open access and they were not produced uh, just because uh, a one, one um, party was requesting that uh, review, but was produced in a, in a response to knowledge needs of multiple um, stakeholders. Okay, so how we were uh, going about stake, uh, how we were going about systematic reviews in this project and um, how uh, was this combined with a, a stakeholder engagement? Well, every systematic review project would, will start, would start with the identification of knowledge needs by very diverse and large group of stakeholders. These knowledge needs would then be prioritized and framed as um, review questions that would uh, further be specified and made um, uh, into uh, systematic review questions. Systematic review would then be conducted by independent review team that was composed of the methodology and subject experts. And then once the draft report was produced, uh, stakeholders would be invited again to comment on that uh, draft. Uh, finally, final report will be produced with the final uh, findings, and these uh, findings would then feed into the um, decision support tools. So this is the general context into which this um, uh, stakeholder uh, engagement approach was applied. Okay, so uh, let's go to the approach uh, to early stakeholder engagement itself. So this approach um, was um, done in order to incorporate stakeholder views and opinions in review planning and design. So the first setting up of the review stage. It was composed of the five steps. So identification of the stakeholders, and then identification of the policy and practice relevant topics, relevant topics, knowledge needs of stakeholders, then framing and prioritization of the review questions, then establishment of specific scope of a review, and then finally would finish with a public review of a draft review protocol. Okay, so this approach is published uh, in 2007 in a special issue on stakeholder engagement, and it's available in the link um, that is presented on this um, slide. Okay, so remember our evidence synthesis pathway from the beginning. Well, we are now focusing, uh, we are now uh, applying the stakeholder engagement approach that just on this uh, first bit of uh, systematic review uh, planning, as I already said. Okay, so how do we start uh, with stakeholder engagement? Obviously, this stakeholder, every stakeholder engagement process starts with the identification of the relevant stakeholders that are going to get involved uh, into the engagement process. This process is the most cr crucial process because um, depending on the stakeholders you select, you might have one or different types of the questions you, you end up reviewing, right? So uh, this identification of relevant sta stakeholders has to be done very carefully, has to be planned very carefully. And it's usually, in this case, done at, as a two-stage process. 
first stage of the identification of the stakeholders is done at the very beginning uh, for the knowledge needs assessment uh, stage. Uh, this um, stakeholder identification is done through the stakeholder analysis. There are many, many methods out there for stakeholder analysis, but uh, this is what stakeholder analysis is about. It's actually about creating a list of stakeholders, just a brainstorming, um, a list of stakeholders that might be affected by your review, that might be involved uh, in your review, that might provide questions for your, your reviews. So this can include uh, county and municipality administrators, other governmental agencies, funding agencies, uh, NGOs, industry representatives, policy makers at any level. Um, you have to think about diverse sets of uh, stakeholders. Then you would normally describe the roles and responsibilities of each uh, stakeholders uh, and try to understand the level of their influence on your review project and how uh, they are linked to the review projects and what are your expectations from them. Based on this, uh, you would then prioritize the stakeholders as high priority, medium priority or low priority and then uh, decide to engage with a smaller or larger group of these stakeholders. The output of this whole process is a prioritized list of the stakeholders who may um, describe their knowledge, who may be relevant for you to describe their knowledge needs and propose review topics. Okay, so once we identify relevant stakeholders, uh, we can then invite them for a meeting and we can engage with them and ask them for the needs for, for, for which kind of knowledge needs they have in order to uh, make informed uh, decisions in, in this case, environmental policy and practice. So we would collect from them uh, policy and practice uh, relevant topics and their concerns um, that they might have and they, uh, that might prevent them uh, to make informed decisions in the jobs they are doing and that would be decision making in, in policy and practice. So, uh, as I said, this is, would be uh, interaction with a broad range of stakeholders across different sectors. And the output of this process would be a list of um, broad, very broad stakeholder generated topics and questions. The more detail of this process is described in the paper. And so these uh, topics could be a very global, national or regional environmental issues, um, perceived gaps in the evidence base, or simply controversial uh, questions that were, for example, recently discussed in public debates. And uh, you need to uh, understand whether these topics are actually the synthesis gaps or places where, where there is enough evidence to connect to conduct systematic reviews, primary research gaps uh, where actually there is no any primary research on certain issue and needs to uh, be uh, more uh, primary research needs to be done or simply maybe these are uh, translation gaps, are gaps that occur in a, a science policy space where, uh, for example, the knowledge from science is not translated into the policy. So these are all three different types of gaps or knowledge needs that the st stakeholders can identify, identify at this stage. So, for example, one of these uh, broad concerns are that were um, um, that were brought up by stakeholders. Um, are uh, during these uh, stakeholder meetings uh, is, for example, what are the reasons for the decline of seabirds in the Baltic Sea region? This is a very broad, open framed question. And if you are conducting systematic reviews, you will know that this question is not specific enough or not reviewable at all. Um, however, um, this is just the first step in the process. Okay. So once you connect or collect uh, the knowledge needs, uh, then you would have to prioritize and uh, frame better these knowledge needs into um, reviewable questions. So first you uh, want would conduct um, initial screening of proposed topics and, and uh, pose question at this stage whether these topics are reviewable at all, is there a need to split them up or narrow them down. 
Um, and after that, um, um, we would conduct a, a, a scoping studies of um, prioritized review topics. And a scoping study is a kind of a quick and dirty overview of the evidence base on a proposed review topic that tries to understand whether there are if there are any other systematic or traditional reviews on the topic, is there sufficient scientific literature uh, on the topic? Is there a need at all for a review on this topic? Um, are proposed questions um, at all scientifically meaningful? Are they answerable, conceptually clear, methodologically feasible, etc.? But also you would, in the scoping study, uh, um, kind of identify uh, stakeholders that were that would be um, relevant for that specific uh, review topic. Okay, so this is an example of a scoping study that was um, done in order to understand whether um, biological control um, by bacillus uh, of mosquitoes is uh, working or not, or does it have any effects on target and non-target organisms and humans. And for example, uh, the, some of the conclusions of this scoping study was that there is a fairly large number of studies on this uh, topic of biological control of mosquitoes, but uh, there are no reports on occurrence of resistance to BTI, uh, I, uh, and that there is a fa fairly large number of studies on the effectiveness of BTI treatment in terms of mosquito ab abundance, and this scoping study proposes that uh, a review may be conducted on this um, area of uh, effectiveness of BTI treatment and persistence of BTI treatment in the environment. Okay, the other example of scoping study would be the one that was conducted in 2013 on the effects of plastic particles on growth and mortality of mar marine organisms, for example. Um, this scoping study concluded that there are fewer studies that the only few studies investigated the effects of the exposures to plastic and that there is not, uh, maybe at that point of time, was not a good moment to conduct a systematic uh, a review on the topic. Okay. Um, as I said, apart from conducting a scoping study, uh, you would also, uh, and kind of identify a review topics uh, out of these general knowledge needs that were collect collected by stakeholders, you would also need to understand what are the stakeholders that will be most interested in this specific review topic. And so in order to do that, uh, we would start from this um, initial broad stakeholder list and then uh, kind of apply a snowball sampling um, in order to get more specific names and specific stakeholders that are relevant for proposed um, systematic um, review topic or area. And um, snowball sampling, however, may entail community bias or overrepresentation of certain stakeholders in their interest. So it's always very recommended to uh, conduct um, active searches for stakeholders with different or opposing interests um, in order to kind of combat the community bias. So the output of this process would be a list of stakeholders that are relevant for specific review topic and that can comment on a review scope in the next phase. Okay, so uh, to summarize, uh, prioritization of the review question um, would entail uh, a scoping study, a list of prioritized review questions that coming out of that scoping study, and a list of review specific stakeholders. Um, if you have a several review questions proposed, as was an example in the scoping study on uh, mosquitoes, uh, you would invite uh, key stakeholders to help you prioritize um, between different re review uh, between different uh, review questions. Uh, based on the scoping study on the um, and additional stakeholder prioritization, um, in our case, Evian would invite an independent body, which is an executive uh, committee, to make a final decision on the review question. Because obviously time and resources are, are limited, so additional prioritization um, and 
this final decision need to be made by an uh, independent uh, by the external to the review team and stakeholders. Okay, so once you decide for a review topic, uh, this review topic might still not be relevant for all the stakeholders, might, might still be very broad, unclear, uh, etc. So then you would invite stakeholders um, again to um, a review specific meeting. And this uh, meeting would be led by the methodology expert and a scientist who would be the topic expert in the field. And they would seek, um, they would uh, uh, present a kind of a preliminary plan for the review to stakeholders and seek input um, of the stakeholders to the scope and the focus of the review. So the stakeholders would be invited to uh, focus on the PICO and PECO structure, on the inclusion strategy, on the search strategy proposed, uh, even on the sources of relevant gray literature. And so uh, this is uh, kind of a, a way of narrowing even down uh, the review question, but also still making it relevant uh, for um, stakeholders. Finally, um, it's, as I said, this is about a fi uh, fine tuning kind of, of the scope according to the stakeholder priorities. However, um, this has to be done with the methodological and scientific limitations. Um, and kind of um, um, uh, questions of, of uh, time and, and resources available and what is possible to do in terms of uh, uh, science and methodology behind. So the review team is, uh, has to make a final decision on the review scope. Uh, obviously, justification for the final decisions on the scope are communicated back to the stakeholders and are provided in the protocol. So the whole process is very transparent. And no one feels excluded uh, if uh, the justifications are made in a very clear way. Okay, so for example, uh, a review on the ability of wetlands to remove nutrients from water that was now published in 2016. Uh, during the, this final stakeholder engagement review specific meeting, um, during that meeting, the, the review scope was extended to cover removal, for example, of phosphorus from water and not only of uh, nitrogen, uh, because that was more relevant to stakeholders, but also stakeholders exp expressed uh, the need to, uh, for example, focus only on created and restored wetlands, but to exclude natural wetlands um, from, the, from the review scope. Okay, so um, then a review protocol, uh, once the, all these comments are, are uh, co uh, collected from this engagement process, a uh, review protocol is being drafted by a review team, by methodology experts, by subject experts, and then this draft protocol is then open for a public review. Uh, every, everyone is uh, kind of invited to comment on this, uh, pro draft protocol and um, obviously uh, uh, it, you have to put a time limit on, on this um, uh, public review so in our case it lasts two to three weeks um, and then these comments are incorporated in the final uh, draft uh, in the final uh, protocol and this protocol is being published. Uh, independent body, in this case, executive committee of our project would review the protocol development and the stakeholder engagement process, and finally approve the final final changes uh, to the protocol. And uh, this uh, early state with this um, early stakeholder engagement basically ends. Um, okay, in one of the examples, uh, example reviews um, on roadside management, uh, roadside management uh, review was um, initially to include management effects on vascular plants and all kinds of animals. However, during the open consultation stage, the scope was narrowed down to cover vascular plants and invertebrates only and exclude, for example, mammals and birds, because one of the stakeholders clarified 
that uh, mammals and birds would not be uh, good indicators of the impact of the roads, roadside management. Okay, so um, now I would like to share uh, with you some of the main challenges, lessons and recommendations uh, from this uh, whole, whole process and this whole uh, experience. Okay, so since we wanted to create reviews that are relevant for a broader audience, uh, we needed to include the broad uh, groups of stakeholders who would then comment and affect the scope of the review. However, this is obviously time and resource demanding. Um, this, although may be in this pre presentation, in this talk, may be uh, represented as a uh, linear process, this stakeholder engagement is a very iterative, non-linear process. Uh, it goes back and forth between the reviewer and, um, and, um, and the stakeholder group. This might be perceived as a challenge, uh, but this also can uh, be beneficial, obviously, to, 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 to the review team. Um, also, what we notice is that sometimes it's very difficult, actually, to respond to knowledge needs, desires, and expectations of the stakeholders and conceal these needs kind of with uh, established review methods. So you still uh, have to keep the systematic review rigor um, in, in, in the methods, but you uh, have to balance that with the uh, stakeholder desires and expectations. And this can prove uh, uh, difficult. However, this was helped by having uh, ultimate decision making as, uh, as the executive committee as an ultimate decision maker who made uh, a final decision throughout the throughout the stakeholder engagement process on, on for example review topics or review scope um, and kind of put the final say um, on 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 where the the reviews uh, could 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 go and which topics could uh, they should address Okay, however, um, it's very, very important to engage with a representative, diverse and well-balanced group of stakeholders. Like this, uh, various biases and Western interests would be avoided. Um, if you are searching for typical groups of your stakeholders, always search for a range of different views within these typical groups. So if you invite uh, uh, NGOs, it, uh, uh, there should be a different kind of types of NGOs in that uh, stakeholder group. Um, it's, if you are, uh, for us was uh, quite easy because we were focusing only on the Swedish context and environmental management um, um, actors um, in Swedish context are very few. However, it's worth exploring the e-participation tool um, to kind of combat geographical bias and kind of spread the audience of uh, included in this engagement process. You have to remember that reviewers gain from stakeholders, and this is a bi-directional exchange. Um, um, engagement with stakeholders, for example, help uh, me and my colleagues to understand better the potential impact of the review um, for those concerned or affected by review process or review findings. Without stakeholder engagement, at especially this very early stage, we were unable to kind of think of, predict of potential impact and we would uh, not be able to create uh, questions that um, we would, we would, uh, we are, we were more able to create questions that would be more kind of perceptive of different values and different views, um, because as you know, it depends on on which question you ask, you get certain answer, and. Um, the most importantly is that I believe that early stakeholder engagement can facilitate endorsement of the review process. 
So the uh, findings of the review are perceived as a legitimate if you involve stakeholders at the early stage and keep them involved throughout the review process. Stakeholders need to feel that they're participated actively and have opportunity to influence. So it's very important uh, to understand that uh, not everyone would be uh, willing, for example, to talk in a meeting where everyone else is presented. So it's um, important to be aware of this kind of a power relations in, in a group of stakeholders and allow everyone to speak or to provide comments either in oral or a written form. And uh, in order to increase this feeling of the participation and um, influence to the review process, it's also very, very important to stay transparent throughout the whole process so everyone would not feel excluded. Uh, and this actually will, um, at the end, pay um, at the end of the review process can pay better because then you uh, also have stakeholders to which a group of uh, established stakeholders to whom you can communicate your findings and hopefully hope that these findings will be taken up to uh, uh, further up to decision making process because these decision make makers have been involved in uh, production um, or production of this of the evidence they're going to use or they at least influence the production of the evidence that they're going to use in their decision making okay so here with this i would slowly finish here are some references that i use in the presentation but more is available in that paper uh, the link uh, to which you have in a, in a couple of first slides and with this, I would like to thank you and maybe open floor uh, for questions and further discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Viviana, for the very interesting session and definitely very informative. Uh, so we're going to start taking questions. Uh, let's see, we have a question from Sumant Kumbajiri Nagraj. Um, Sumant, I'm going to unmute you if you'd like to direct your question or comment to Viviana. Hello, yeah. Sumant. Hi, Viviana. Hello. Hello. Hello, yes. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah, uh, it's a nice presentation. Uh, I'm from uh, India, working presently in Malaysia. When you talk about uh, including diverse stakeholders, I have a question. Uh, if the diverse stakeholders talk different language and understand different languages and there is no common language, uh, do you have any suggestion? How do we include them in, in the research? Hi, Suman. That's a very, very interesting and valuable question and a, and a point. In our case, we haven't had a language barrier uh, when it comes to stakeholder engagement. But um, I assume that then engagement would, would have to uh, be done uh, through some kind of, maybe not through a face-to-face -face meetings, but through a kind of a, a e-participation where, where you would have to um, translate um, your uh, questions um, that would be um, kind of posed to, to different types of uh, stakeholders with uh, uh, different um, talking, different languages. So perhaps this e-participation platforms uh, where the engagement can be done in a virtual space in different languages facilitated by a, by a review expert that and, and help with a, with a translator, I assume, would be the better approach. Uh, this approach that we had so far was mostly based on kind of a face-to-face -face meeting where the exchange happens um, in a in a face-to-face -face kind of a, a, a discussion. But I assume if there is um, if there is a broader audience or audience that is more diverse, uh, e-participation would be uh, one of the options for that. I don't know. Maybe. It's Maybe others have some comments to that or some other ideas. 
yeah i agree with your suggestion about the e participation but uh, uh, if we uh, introduce e participation are we not limiting the participants only to be a, a certain category who are internet literate or who who have the capabilities to use the internet what about mm -hmm. um, people who don't have internet facilities who are not computer literate yes that's a very are very we, good are, point yeah are we not excluding them by telling that we will include in the e platform yes we do definitely so you would then include some kind of bias in your sample of stakeholders so i guess um, i don't know you would have to have uh, translators um in 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 your yeah during your meetings this this seems to be like a like a only solution <laughs> i'm sorry yeah. that i cannot provide any more clever yeah. Work. No, no, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> well, it's actually a very interesting comment, and we face that with many of um, interventions or activities that are uh, that are based actually on the internet. But um, so, Sumanth, I would actually like to ask you, how would you suggest uh, dealing with this, or what would be an alternative that would not be restricted, uh, actually that uh, that would not be restricted by specific access uh, recommendations or requests? Um, I think uh, definitely as a suggestion came that we need to hire a translator and um, I would rather go for an interview. Um, I would uh, select my stakeholders and uh, I would interview them probably what is their uh, opinion and uh, I would collate the findings. I, I don't see any other uh, way to get the information from different strata of the society. Yeah, yeah thank you. That's very interesting. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so th thank you, Sumanth, for your input and for this discussion. Um, we still have a few minutes, so if anyone else would like to uh, make a comment or ask a question, um, discuss directly with Liana, please feel free to uh, send your question now or to raise your hand uh, so that we unmute you. Tamara, maybe I can ask one very general question. Yes, definitely, go ahead. Um, I wonder if, uh, and thanks Sumit for starting this, but is anyone does anyone else see any other challenges of the presented report uh, presented approach in your working context i would be very much interested to to hear uh, more about that since this approach was really appro uh, really really applied only to one very specific context I guess we don't have any answers to this. Maybe it's a little bit premature to ask. As people maybe, have not. Yeah, maybe it's something we're thinking about after this uh, webinar. Yes, once people digest what they heard because it was a little bit too much of information. Yes, potentially. Mm -hmm. But great information. Yes. Okay, so um, Brianna, thank you so much for this great presentation. Um, and I thank our attendees 
for joining us today. Please make sure to follow us for the other sessions for this webinar series. If you have any questions, please feel free to um, send to uh, Brianna or send us the question. We can direct you and connect you with Brianna. Thank you very much once again, everyone. And thanks, Tamara, for hosting this uh, webinar. Thank you so much, Brianna. Take care now. Bye.